Well, I'm very happy to be here at this fine institution and we'll note that I'm within 50 miles of home so I don't have to pretend to be an expert and we'll have a little fun occasionally and during this presentation. The Mud to Parks project was has been going on for a number of years. I first got involved back in uh, about 1998 when we visited the U.S. Steel site in Chicago. Over the years there have been a large number of people involved with the project. Uh, that includes all the scientific surveys, the Department of Natural Resources has been the home unit in state government for the project over the years. We've had a lot of help from private companies such as Artco Fleeting, Midwest Foundation, Caterpillar and other entities, a variety of municipalities and park districts. And probably most importantly to actually getting things going has been the political will of current Governor Pat Quinn, former Congressman Ray LaHood, Attorney General Lisa Madigan, former Lieutenant Governor Corrine Wood, and a variety of other people who are too numerous to mention. Major contributors at the surveys include Mike Demissi, Nani Bomek, Rich Cahill, Jim Slowakowski, and Robert Darmody from the uh, Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences at the University. There were some earlier efforts at using sediment in Illinois beneficially. One of the first was Wyndham J. Roberts, the local weatherman from the 1960s and 70s. Uh, we talked back in 1969 about a project at Carlinville where sediment was hydraulically dredged from Lake Carlinville and placed on adjacent farmland. There were projects done by university researchers at Paradise Lake at, near Mattoon. The city of Springfield has used sediment beneficially on uh, farm ground and Burns Clancy did a project at Crystal Lake in Urbana where they took sediment out of the lake and put it in a truck and hauled it away and that was my first experience with seeing sediment placed in a truck and hauled away successfully without making a huge mess. There's some things that I think are important for the whole issue of beneficial reuse of sediment. One is that freshwater bodies worldwide are losing about 1% of their capacity annually due to sedimentation. This is not a uniform 1%, it varies with terrain and geography, but generally about 1% is lost a year. So sediment removal, I believe, will become increasingly important as a means of addressing this issue, primarily because the sedimentation of reservoirs and backwaters eliminates wildlife habitat, recreation, and for most people, probably more importantly, irrigation water storage and water supply storage. Sediment can be viewed in many cases as a resource out of place. It's largely topsoil, which washed off the land into a lake or water body, and it's out of place. And by returning it to the land, we can return it to good use. Many areas near waterways and water bodies, such as lakes, need soil for landscaping, remediation of old industrial sites, and restoration of environmental habitat. So we think clean sediment, if it's properly tested, can be used to address many of these issues. To give you an idea of the magnitude of the problem in Illinois, the State Water Survey has done several sediment surveys at reservoirs around the state, and they released a report that gave their estimates of sediment accumulation in water supply reservoirs between 1990 and 2030. You can see Lake Decatur is expected to add about 8 million cubic yards of mud to that lake. Lake Springfield about 8 million and all water supply reservoirs statewide over 150 million cubic yards and that is just water supply reservoirs. It doesn't include small recreation lakes, detention ponds, and river backwaters. Just to give you an idea of what a reservoir looks like when it is completely silted full, here's a small reservoir in California, and after about 15 years it was completely filled with sand and soil. The magnitude of the need for sediment or topsoil on the land is going to increase with time. Um, this is a map for the Millennium Reserve Project in the South Chicago Calumet area. And there are something like 3,300 acres of land that are hopefully going to be restored for use as commercial, residential, parks, and habitat in that small area of the state. These are areas that have been industrialized in the past. The industries have moved on. 
there needs to be some remediation or other things done. And 3,300 acres covered with soil is a big order. And where do we get a lot of the soil now that's used in Illinois and the Midwest? It's basically when somebody needs topsoil, they get it from some type of broker who gets it from new development sites like housing divisions all over the northern part of the state and even locally. They scrape all of the topsoil off new developments, whether they're recreational or not recreational, whether they are for housing developments or commercial developments. And then the soil is frequently sold and there are some minimal regulations for returning a little bit of soil to the area that it's being removed from. But basically there's no regulation, so many people buy a new home in a suburban area and find they can't even grow a carrot because there's an inch or less of topsoil. Now, the concept of what is soil is a rather confusing thing. There are no real national or state guidelines or laws on what is soil. In many urban areas, what is passed off as topsoil is called clean urban soil. Here's a picture of some that showed up at one of our sites in Chicago. It's basically material that was excavated from construction sites around the city. Uh, in the case on the left, the white dots are, among other things, there's rocks there, but also oyster shells that clearly came from the coastal regions of the East Coast or the Gulf Coast. They're not anything like local mussel shells. This material also contained rebar, broken concrete, bottles from going back uh, probably to the late 1800s. Many of them were broken. There's a lot of broken glass in this material. But in many urban areas all over the country, if not the world, this type of material is considered topsoil. In many cases, they will try and put another layer of better soil on top of it that comes from a farm or something. But a big issue, obviously, is what really is soil. Now we coined the term, we gave some thought to what we might call this urban soil depending on its quality and we thought that since the soil was somewhat crappy we would call it crap. So we have class A which is city rubble and pavement, class B we determined to be concrete, rebar, and pavement, and class C is something that you can't really add plants to because it's not likely to be of suitable quality for growing plant material. Now, contaminant testing, contaminants are a big issue with sediment all over the world. We tested for 24 metals, 72 semi-volatiles, we test for PCBs, pesticides, PAHs, etc. And let's see. we discovered some interesting things. This is some work by Rich Cahill at the Geo Survey. And you'll see in the Chicago area, Things like mercury, lead, and zinc tend to be higher than they are in the Peoria area, except for zinc here, and that happens to be an anomaly because there was a zinc smelter at Lake Depew, and that's what you're seeing here. But as you go down river, generally speaking, the level of contaminants drops dramatically. Our samples at Beardstown had no trouble meeting any reasonable standard. Um, New Boston on the Mississippi River, very clean. A lot of our local reservoirs, I think you'll find, are very clean also. The one at Litchfield, just about everything was a non-detect. The bottom line is we've discovered places where it would not be a good idea to take sediment to use as topsoil, and a lot of other places where it's perfectly fine, and some others where some more testing would be necessary to make sure you work in the right spots. Here's a sediment core just to give you an idea of how contaminant levels can vary. Let's pick lead. In the top of this Peoria Lake core, which is roughly eight feet long, lead is 40 parts per million. When you get down a bit lower, this is about roughly three and a half to four feet deep. Lead is only half as much lead in the sediment there. And when you get down into the original bottom, it's about half again, down to about nine parts per million. Uh, Benzoate pyrene is 240 parts per billion at the top, 72 in the middle, and 44 at the bottom. Soil organic matter is roughly 2% in the lower level, and about 4.5 to 5 in the upper level. So again, it's important to know what you're dealing with, because not only does the sediment vary horizontally, 
what's in it varies vertically. Okay, now we're going to show you some projects. This first one is the U.S. Steel site on Lake Michigan. This is the old U.S. Steel Softworks site. It used to be the biggest steel mill in the world. It was rendered somewhat obsolete after World War II when Poland, Germany, and Japan all got brand new factories, and the United States factories that won World War II had not been replaced. But basically, U.S. Steel and its partners are donating roughly 80 acres, which is a full mile of waterfront, to the city for use by the Chicago Park District as a publicly owned park. The rest of it will be developed for commercial, residential, and some other recreational uh, developments. The main issue here, which I think I had my first meeting on this in 1998, basically there's no soil here. All of this land you see was built out into the lake by steel mill slag, which was generated by the steel mill. And there's other places like that, but this is rather spectacular. There's, according to Dr. Darmody, what's there should not be called soil. So I try not to call it soil. Here we are at Peoria Lake. We are digging. This is 2004. We're using a cable arm clamshell bucket on a crane for this particular phase of the project. Notice there's virtually no free water in the barge. A lot of people didn't believe that was possible, but again, we worked with the contractors very hard on that project, which was a research project where we had full control, rather than a project where some other people are in control. But anyway, you can see the material coming up was very dry. Most people think of uh, dredge sediment as like chocolate milk. That was Here we are. Uh, putting the sediment down on the lower 15 acres of that site. We're using a bulldozer to spread it. It's coming out of the trucks rather nicely. Um, last year it looked like this. It's a combination of a park with benches and there's prairie plantings within it. Um, in 2012, we, this past year, last year and this summer, we did more work bringing up material from Peoria Lake. This time we're using a clamshell excavator on, and that machine is much more flexible than a standard crane. Here you can see, note the church back here, St. Michael's. Notice this is wet sediment. It's been out of the river less than a week. Um, coming out of the truck, it stacks about two and a half feet high. If we use a bulldozer on it, we can get it up to about four. And if it dries for a month, we can get it eight or 10 feet without much trouble. Um, here's another place with the same church on the same day, only this material's been out there about a month. You can see it's already fairly dry. It's got a lot of desiccation cracks. You could walk on it. Um, January 1st, or actually January 22nd, it's been frozen and thawed several times up there in Chicago. It's been dried by the wind and wetted by melting snow. But you can see it's developing soil structure rather rapidly due to the freezing and thawing and the action of the wind. Here it is in May. Notice it's very granular. You can put your fingers down that about eight inches without any tools at all. It's just freezing and thawing. It turned into really nice looking topsoil. In the background, the material that doesn't look as good is a mixture of this and the lower material, the clay material. Here it is. Um, in September, before we put the grass seed down on it, this is that same general area, but the church is behind us. You can see the equipment out there has been leveling it and pulverizing the soil. Here it is last week with the church in the background. It's a tremendous difference. You wouldn't believe these pictures that you've seen were taken about a year apart. Eastport Marina at East Peoria, the water used to be six to eight feet deep in that area. Now, if you're outside of the channel, it's less than two feet. Um, they are using an innovative machine called a dry dredge with a concrete pump on it to pump material, and it's being used for downtown redevelopment. This is a dry dredge. It has a very small bucket. It's very maneuverable. It reaches down. It's got spuds. It can move itself around the area. There's a concrete pump in there that pushes mud, very thick mud, through a pipe. There you see the hopper being loaded. There's the pipe going several hundred feet into a truck. And if we're lucky, video
This material is a little bit wetter than, or drier than we're used to. It, it, they have to add water because there's a lot of peat in it. So this is going to be more fluid than we like because they add water so it would go through the pipe. There you see the truck being loaded. A nice thing about this, if you know anything about materials handling, is you only have to handle this material once. Out of the lake, into the truck. And then you dump the truck. And here, you see the truck dumping. This is obviously a lot wetter than the material in Chicago. Um, you could spread this material on a farm field if you wanted, and have to do very little work to get it scattered to a decent depth. Our other trucks make a big pile two and a half to three feet high. This one, we'd be lucky to hit six inches. But East Peoria has anticipated that, and it dries faster when it's thin. So it's all good. There you can see the material. This is two truck loads. You can see it makes quite a mess. It looks like concrete. It's pretty sticky, but it makes a wonderful soil. Here's another spot where the same process is being used. This has been out about two weeks. Once it dries, the city pushes it up into piles. And just so you know, that dry dredge can put out material a lot thicker than what you saw. This is pure sediment, but probably a safety play loam. There's no peat involved, so they didn't have to add any water. They just push it through the pipe. Walton Lake at Litchfield. The dam had a little accident after 100 some years and started to become a hazard, so the Department of Transportation made them drain it. While the lake was drained, the Park District heard about our project, and this is the upper arm of the lake. They got some mud to park some money, got a long stick excavator, and basically put some, uh, what do you call these, mats out into the, what used to be the lake bed. And they dug down almost 10 feet. This is going to be a great fishing hole. It's already been stocked. The material went up about several miles away to where the city has a new water treatment plant that needed soil. We dumped it out of trucks. We used an end loader to spread it like icing on a cake, about eight inches to a foot thick. Then we threw grass seed on it. And here you can see it's spread out here. And it's grown a lot of grass. This is another spot on the lake where the Park, you can see all the grass growing. Normally there would, would be about a foot of water here, but the, during the drought it went down. You see all the vegetation growing on it. The park district took some equipment, went in from the shore, and dug this out, and now they've got a place where boats and fishermen can have a good time without any trouble at all. Fox Waterway up near Antioch, Illinois. They got some mud to parks money to build some specialized dewatering cells without going into any details. A hydraulic dredge pipe comes in at this corner. The sediment mixed with about 90% water is pumped into the cell. It works its way around. There's a baffle here you don't see now. And it fills up. There's a second cell. Here you see the dredge pipe with the topsoil that washes down from Wisconsin is in there, and every winter they get a amphibious excavator. They go in and scoop the material out, let it dry for a few days. Then they truck it to their processing facility, which is a couple miles away. They run it through a pulverizer, and now they're beginning to sell this material for, I don't remember how many dollars a yard, but it used to cost them $3 a cubic yard to landfill it. This is some of the best farmland in the world and they were paying somebody to put it in a landfill. We've, we're trying to change that. I first talked to these people when I was at Pollution Control Board, I think in 1980. So it's, it's taken a while to get some of these concepts going. Rice Lake State Fish and Wildlife Area, we've got a lot of sedimentation issues there. This is the park ramp. At Normal Pool, there's less than a foot of water here. This is a very famous waterfowl hunting area. The boaters were upset about not being able to get out. Lisa Madigan and Pat Quinn worked together to get us some funding. And we are, as we speak, they are out there using some unusual dredging equipment. They have to be a little bit creative because technically you could put a long stick excavator up here and dredge this area. But we needed them to go out several hundred feet, hopefully 200 yards out into the lake itself so the boats can get up on plane for those of you who know about duck hunting. So what they did was they got these little tiny barges 
and a John boat, and they push these little barges around, they fill them, and then move them. And then they are unloaded by another excavator. This is coming out of the lake. Now this is a bucket, not a clam. And there's an amazing amount of water, even though it looks full. Tremendous amount of water still in this. So he's going to drain it, he tips it, he twists it. I got a lot of video of this, but this is just the one that would come up nicely. But they get a lot of water in there, so you'll see when the truck dumps, it's going to have a lot more water than Chicago, even though it was done with an excavator. Here they're going out of the little barge into the truck. Some of those buckets were very, very watery. This one wasn't too bad. Anybody might use a truck that seals really tight. This group in Washington, Illinois, has them. Now we're at the Banner Marsh State Fish and Wildlife Area. This is an old strip mine. The soil quality is incredibly bad. And what we're doing is providing topsoil for their wildlife plantings. You see the material coming out. Some of the deeper clay material is in these. You see it's not stacking up quite as nicely as the Chicago material, but a lot better than the East Peoria material. Once this dries and weathers and they run a little bit of harm equipment over it, the clay material will mix with the regular black dirt and you'll have quite a, quite a growth medium. And as you can see, sometimes even I get too close and you get a mud pack. Lieutenant Governor Corey Wood thought this material was good enough to send to France's spa mud at $50 a pound. We haven't tried that yet. But here you can see a pile from this lake. And again, sometimes the excavator bucket gets down to the clay material, but it all averages out when they mix it. Here you can see the field. This is after about four days of work. And we're gonna cover probably two acres, anywhere from four to six inches deep. This is a bucket of Peoria Lake sediment, just to show you the consistency this material has. It's coming out of this like a sheet right into the truck. It's not a problem to handle at all. These sunflowers are growing on Banner Marsh sediment that we put on the same field you just saw us dumping on. This was put down in 2004. Bumper crops of flowers. Lake Decatur is currently in the process of letting bids and contracts for about a $60 million dredging project. They have a current program which has, a, this is a discharge into their lake which is about a half a mile. This area is what we call a sediment settling pond. All the water in here is pumped from Lake Decatur with about anywhere from 10 to 15 percent sediment in it. The sediment settles out and the water is drained away without boring you with 100 pictures of the process. Basically after you get it out of the lake onto the uh, land and let it dry a bit, you end up with a pretty high quality topsoil, some of which is being tested here, and that's one of our hourly students loading five gallon buckets. Uh, some other things that are useful in this whole arena are geotextile tubes. These tubes are being used to hold an island together in Peoria Lake, the wildlife habitat island. They're basically pumped full of sediment. The concrete pump fills them up very nicely, but you can hook a hydraulic dredge to them with or without polymers and pump them full of sediment and the water, at least initially, will escape through the pores in the fabric. These are frequently used to dewater sediment in areas where there's not enough room for a big lake and they don't have the ability to truck it somewhere easily. So basically, they fill the tube with sediment. They let it sit for anywhere from two months to a year. They then cut the fabric apart and come in with an excavator or an end loader and load trucks and haul it away. Uh, these are HESCO baskets. I took a picture of this area three weeks before Katrina hit. And this is a picture about three weeks after Katrina hit. These little bags stayed in place and they stayed full of sediment. I think these have tremendous potential for restoring lakes and other things in Illinois as well as making uh, little berms for duck habitat and things like that. They're basically a, a fabric bag with a wire mesh. Unlike a gabion, they're very easy to handle. You can fill them with rock, you can fill them with soil, or sand or sediment. They're used in war zones, particularly the desert, 
you could take a bunch of these that are six feet by six feet by six feet, line them up, and in just a few hours you can have revetments to protect your planes and your sleeping soldiers. I rented a bunch of trucks from Putzmeister one day. These are the people that make the concrete handling equipment. This device here is a, a, a pump truck that's used to pump concrete. You've probably seen them in building situations. We thought they'd handle mud, so we rented those and we loaded it up with mud and the mud worked fine. And this is a concrete handling truck. It's called a telebelt. It has a telescoping uh, conveyor belt on it. A lot of people said the mud would plug the pipe and the sediment would liquefy on the belt. Well, what happened was it came out of the pipe just fine and it handled perfectly on the belt. Even the transfer points had no issues and the normal belt scrapers designed for handling concrete kept the belt extremely clean handling sediment. There was no drag back. I have a couple hours of video on that if anybody really wants to see some fun. <laughs> After we did that, we rented poly gravel pit for a full scale test and we picked up a few tons of sediment. We put it on conveyor belts and we ran it around the gravel pit. We went up slopes like this with no trouble. We went through uh, transfer points on three different conveyors and basically had a lot of fun and made a mess. Some things to think about in relation to this whole arena of beneficial use. One is that I like to think at least for the next 20 or 30 years of sediment, topsoil from sediment as a renewable resource. You can dredge Lake Peoria up to 2 million cubic yards a year and it'll all be back the next year. You can dredge Lake Decatur up to about 130 acre feet a year and it'll all be replaced next year. Not necessarily in the same spot, but within the lake. So, if you can get a system going where you remove a certain amount annually or every two or three years, you can get ahead of your problem over time. Remember, it takes 50 to 100 years for these reservoirs to fill with sediment. Our problem is we wait 50 or 60 years to start addressing the problem at all. I like to think of it as an ant and elephant situation. When you build a dam or a highway or a drainage facility or something, Think like an elephant. You've got a lot of equipment, a lot of capital, a lot of money, a lot of people. You're making a big project. But once it's done, turn it over to the ants. Remember, ants and termites move more soil on this planet than any other creature or human combined. If you remove a little bit of your sediment every year, whether you deal with a port or a reservoir, you'll have a manageable amount, something that could fit into a normal city or port district budget. You'll have an amount coming out that you could probably use locally. The way we do it now, we wait and then we have to move 100 million cubic yards or 50 million yards. We've got huge piles and it costs lots of money to store it, dewater it, and then you can't get rid of it. So we could make it, the system could be a lot better. Can we get lake managers to cooperate? Imagine if Decatur, Bloomington, Danville, and all the other towns around here with the sedimentation issue got together with some contractors, arranged some equipment, and had a manageable amount in their city budget each year so that they might spend three months, three months <coughs> dredging at Lake Bloomington, three months at Otter Lake, a month at Danville. You could make this work on a manage manageable basis. What about stockpiling? If you're doing a big project, why not stack it up and store it against the time there's a lot of soil needed for a project? Unfortunately, the state bonding rules won't let you stockpile things, and there's a lot of issues around that. I've often thought Peoria could build a replica of the Pyramid of Giza <coughs> out of sediment. They could actually build six or seven of them, and you'd have a tourist event right there. <laughs> um, can you blend sediment with other things like biosolid to make a manufactured soil of a better quality? The answer is yes. We've proved that, so have some other people. Is there a need to regulate the removal and relocation of topsoil so that people don't buy a brand new house and find out they can't grow a carrot because somebody took their topsoil as if they mined it? I think the answer to that is yes. 
but there's a lot of issues involving that, particularly the fact that soil quality varies dramatically across the state. It would take some thinking. But I think if you buy a house in central Illinois, you have a presumptive right to a decent amount of topsoil. Do dredging regulations need updating? Yes. Much of our regulations were done 40 years ago when problems were different. Dredging used to be something I fought all the time because the Corps of Engineers on the Mississippi River, they would dig sand out of the navigation channel with a dredge and they would put it in the backwaters where the ducks and fish had certain proprietary rights that were being ignored. This was a huge problem to the point where several states sued the government to stop that process. Some things to think about for the future is that bond guidelines might need to be adapted a bit. Right now, under bonding authority, you, it's almost impossible to do a dredging project. The Mud to Parks money is largely bond money, but it's being used to provide topsoil. The dredging just happens to be where the topsoil is coming from. You're not justifying it on the basis of dredging, it's being justified on the long-term use of the topsoil in an area that doesn't otherwise have topsoil. Procurement rules are a huge issue right now, particularly with the new state laws on procurement. It's very difficult to hire an engineering or an A&E firm that has experience with dredging and sediment handling because the way the rules work, you can't be selective. You, it's almost like taking a name out of the hat. It's not quite that bad, but imagine it that way. We have one project where a rather innovative sediment reuse project is being designed by a firm that basically deals with highways. And the project is a mess because the mind frame and the mindset it takes to make the jump from a highway to a habitat structure made out of sediment is quite a leap and it doesn't fit the standard process. Inter and interagency reviews are a big issue. Um, many of you who are in any engineering form are aware of how hard it is to get permits out of state and federal government. Well, when you try and do something like move mud from a jurisdiction in Peoria to Chicago, which its own jurisdictions, you've added a triple layer of bureaucracy on top of a state and federal regulatory bureaucracy. Try and get the Chicago Park District to agree with the Fond du Lac Park District, ADM, Art Co. Fleeting, the trucking group, the unions involved, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then the insurance people within the various companies doing a project. When you do these complex projects, you get a whole lot of people at the table, all of whom, or many of whom, have veto power. And it takes a lot of charisma to bring them all together. Particularly, sometimes, the lawyers are trying to defend the interest of their client. And they get into these arguments over details that are very technical. We solved one of our biggest problems that was about to shut down our Chicago project over an insurance issue by having the lawyers and a couple of vice presidents get together with the insurance people from the two firms and let the insurance people talk to each other while the lawyers listened. And it took them about five minutes to figure out that they were both on the same page, they were just using different words. But when that all got translated through the company's hierarchy, it looked like they were at loggerheads, when in fact there was really no problem. So those kind of things happen. And can this concept be commercialized? I believe the answer is yes. Soil is more valuable than oil. Ask anybody from the Arabian Peninsula that question, I think they will tell you that the soil is more valuable. And it's just a matter of time and the techniques. So we're about finished here. Another thing I'll mention is the Corps of Engineers. When you talk about regulatory changes, Corps of Engineers have certain rules they operate under or interpret the rules to operate under. And one of them is least cost alternatives. Basically, they will do a beneficial use of sediment laden with sand in the Gulf of Mexico going out of New Orleans. The big problem with the Gulf of Mexico's delta at the Mississippi River mouth is that the sediment that historically for thousands of years spread over the delta each time it flooded now is being channeled out into the Gulf and doesn't get where it needs to be. 
The Corps of Engineers is constantly dredging to keep that channel open, but the dredge material, by and large, goes right back into the channel to be washed out. Their argument is if they were to pump it over the levees and into the marshes where it belongs, it would cost more money. So they will, they will pump it if it doesn't cost more money than dropping it right back into the channel next to their dredge. And they want somebody else to pay for it. But some of us think they created the problem. It should be part of their cost to resolve it. But anyway, that's just one little example. Then you get into jurisdictional things. We were looking at moving sediment from Peoria Lake to northern Indiana. Well, when you do that, you cross three Corps of Engineer boundaries, two state boundaries, with each one with its own regulatory framework. Then you've got the corporate issues, and it goes downhill from there, just in terms of the amount of people that have to be dealt with. Funding cycles are another big deal. The state fiscal year starts July 1st. The federal fiscal year, if they ever decide to have a budget, starts sometime in October. Various municipalities have differences. Most people will not store money. Cities don't have a rainy day fund in many cases, so it's very hard to come up with money when you need it. It's also difficult to find somebody who needs soil and has the means to obtain it at the same time somebody is about to do some dredging. So all these things have to come together serendipitously or be forced. And I think you know how we've done some of those. So with that, I think we'll take questions. That's my email. Okay, thank you very much, John. <laughs> we have time for two questions that people are uh, here in the audience. Have a question? Yes, and could you speak up very loudly or could you repeat the question, John, for our audience? During these dredging projects, do you ever see animals that are brought up with the mud? How do you deal with, with that? Well, they're in the barge. <laughs> and there's no way to get them out of the barge without killing yourself. Uh, basically, the only animals that we see coming up alive are mayflies, carinomids, and a certain number of mussels, and remarkably few of those. So. Um, I think I've seen three live catfish that came up with a bucket. We've never seen an Asian carp. So the basic answer is there's some little critters in there, and the ones that would be the most significant would be the mussels. But the dredging area is very small. Like on the project we just did, it was roughly 90 feet wide by almost a mile long. And that's it tiny fraction, so we're not going to make them extinct by doing this. Okay, uh, we have two questions from our mind that they'll ask if you can repeat them then. Um, is the rate of sedimentation largely due to runoff from farmlands or due to natural erosion or both? Is the amount of sedimentation largely due to erosion from farmland, natural sedimentation, or both? The State Water Survey has done some studies on this. And the two primary components contributing to the sedimentation are erosion from farmland, which has decreased dramatically in the last 30 years due to the efforts of the NRCS and other entities. The other primary source is erosion from stream beds and stream banks. And this has largely been brought about by modifications to the stream under the guise of flood control, where they've changed the geometry of the streams, creating erosion problems, making them much worse than they were historically. There's always been erosion. There always will be erosion. But we have exacerbated it quite a bit. And so, the, yes, there's natural erosion. The two primary inputs are the stream bank and bed and the farmland. And in localized areas, construction sites can do a lot of sedimentation if they're don't take care of their issues with their soil and screening. Okay, there's another one online, so ask and then maybe we'll close. Okay. Um, are the toxic substances found in the sediments near Chicago um, any problems as far as dredging? Or? In many, if not most areas, yes, they're a problem. 
the it's been going on up there for a long time with lots of industry before there were regulations. So. One thing I should mention that the Geological Survey studies where they can actually tell roughly when a sediment layer was deposited using cesium-137 and when the nuclear bomb test started and stopped. They found that the, for example, lead increases from like 1900 up to the 30s, 50s, and then around 1970 it starts going back almost to background level due to taking, most likely taking lead out of gasoline and paint. That correlates perfectly with the decrease in the lead in human blood over the same period. So there's been a big, a lot of progress made there, but we, we try to be very careful looking at where we recommend any sediment come from. And right now we've not gone any further upstream than uh, lower Peoria Lake. When you get above that through the narrows at Peoria, there's spots where there's elevated contaminants, more so than we'd be comfortable with. But not everywhere. It's not a across the board problem. Okay, uh, well, thank you, John, and I'm sure John will stay around for any other questions. Thanks, John.